Back in 2018, we saw gaming laptops trend towards high refresh 144Hz displays with super thin bezels, and that was a big deal because when we got laptops with RTX GPUs, they were pushing out frame rates that far exceeded 60 frames per second. So you weren't able to benefit much with a 60Hz display. But the one thing that I always thought these laptops lacked was image quality. And when I saw the spec sheet earlier this year for the Legion 7i, the screen looked really good, and that got me very interested in this laptop. Now, most of the reviews for the Legion Y740 last year were pretty positive, I would say, assuming you got it on sale, that is. I think it was $1,900 at retail price, which was a bit of a stretch, but the frequent price drops to $1,400 made it a really compelling option. So my thought process was this. If the Legion 7i took all the good things about the Y740 and improved upon it, like with the screen, then this would also be an easy recommendation, especially because I wasn't able to find any other laptops with a screen this good. So let's talk about that screen first. The base configuration comes with a standard 144Hz panel, but you also have the option of upgrading to a 144 or a 240Hz panel rated for 500 nits of brightness and HDR400 support, and I would consider those two to be the standout features of this screen. The rest of the display is also quite good. The contrast ratio, color gamut, and color accuracy are all what I would consider good, and I don't really have any criticisms to offer there. Uh, except for color accuracy, it's good, but not amazing. I don't know how different the 144Hz panel will be, but for this one, the 240Hz panel that I'm reviewing, you should probably calibrate it if you require perfect color accuracy. The response times are good, but when you enable HDR, for some reason, the response times just tank. Uh, everything is really blurry, and it wasn't even something that I was looking out for. The ghosting was just particularly bad with HDR enabled. Whether you'll actually use HDR is up to the individual person. I don't think the ghosting is going to make this unusable in all situations. For example, it might differ between gaming and watching a movie, but it's not like this feature is available on any other laptop. So even if you don't use it, it's not like you're losing out on anything to begin with. And again, with HDR disabled, the response times are perfectly fine. But really, I think the big feature for me is the brightness. Brighter screens tend to appear more vibrant, and so games will generally look a lot better, especially single player games with a bigger focus on story and graphics. And when you combine that with ray tracing and HDR, it really is a big step up in the way games look. I'm personally very excited to see laptops running HDR screens and RTX 3000 GPUs. It's gonna be nuts. The speakers on here actually sound pretty good despite being bottom firing, and a lot of that is from the tuning they applied in software. This is one of few examples where I actually prefer the speakers with the default EQ applied. They're loud, the bass response is present, and it's enough to add warmth and fill out the lower frequencies, but it doesn't use a separate subwoofer, so in terms of quantity, it's not particularly large in amount. The vocals on here are also quite forward and emphasized, and I think these are usable for just about any purpose. They sound good for YouTube, music, and gaming. The layout on here has changed from the Y740. So with that one, you had a 60% layout with an extra column of macros on the left, whereas this removes the macros for a number pad on the right. Which layout you prefer will obviously depend on your use case. For gaming, you're not really gonna benefit much from a number pad, but if you're working with spreadsheets, then obviously you will. In terms of the typing experience, the key travel is quite shallow, but it's very tactile. So it ends up being decent to type on, I would say. It's not a keyboard that really stands out as being particularly enjoyable to type on for people that are really picky. I would say this is a keyboard that was very easy to get used to. My typing speed and accuracy are right in line with what I usually get on my mechanical keyboard, but it loses a bit on the comfort because of the shallow key travel. It's a good keyboard, but it could definitely use more key travel. Same with literally every other gaming laptop except for the Alienware M15. That's still the one and only gaming laptop keyboard that I actually like. Uh, this uses what I believe to be a plastic trackpad. I find that the surface has the sticking effect when you drag with a bit too much pressure. It's smooth in that it's not a rough and gritty texture like sandpaper, but the sticking effect is kind of annoying. And regarding tracking accuracy, I would say it's quite good. I'm not really sure if the way I described it was clear enough, so here's a sound demo to illustrate what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. 
In terms of build, it's similar to the Y740 with some relatively small improvements all around. So the screen is made of plastic and is fairly soft. The keyboard deck, I believe, is made from metal from what I can see. It's got very little flex and feels high quality to the touch. It doesn't at all feel like plastic or like cheap paint. I also like the color they used here. I think dark gray looks a lot better than black, especially at hiding oils and sweat from your hands. The hinge tension is excellent, and it uses this design where the hinge and the screen doesn't interfere with the rear exhaust vents. A big counterexample would be the MSI Prestige 15. It's basically right in the middle of the rear exhaust. I don't actually know how much this affects thermals, if at all, but this sort of just popped into my mind and I thought I'd share this observation. For ports, you have a Thunderbolt 3 port, a USB-C, and a headphone jack on the left, a single USB-A on the right, that's USB 3.2 Gen 1, HDMI 2.0, two USB-As, also 3.2 Gen 1, Ethernet, and the charging port on the rear. Pretty good selection, I would say. Now inside, you have what I would consider to be the standard in terms of upgradability for gaming laptops. Basically, all gaming laptops will have two RAM slots, two M.2 slots, and an upgradable Wi-Fi card. On this particular laptop, there's a cover that protects the memory, so to access it, you'll have to pry open these clips around the perimeter and then remove it. But yes, the memory is upgradable. The fans in here are quite a bit bigger than most gaming laptops I've come across. It looks fairly similar to the Omen 15, which had amazing cooling performance. It doesn't actually perform as well as the Omen 15, however, I would consider 75 watts on the CPU to be around the upper end of thin and light gaming laptops, with the Omen 15 being the sole exception. I did notice, however, during gaming that the CPU and GPU weren't boosting as high as they could have. There was a pretty good amount of thermal headroom left, but I know that some people prefer not to run their laptops close to 100 degrees in order to minimize risk of damage and therefore extend the lifespan of a laptop. The trade-off here is that you get a 5-7% reduction in gaming performance in return for significantly lower temperatures. Games still run great, however, the RTX 2070 Super Max Q pushes out some really good frame rates, and I definitely wouldn't say the lower boost clocks are negatively impacting gaming performance in any significant way. Again, that's only with a combined CPU and GPU load. If you stress them individually, they will run at higher temperatures for higher boost clocks, and therefore faster performance. There's a 78 watt hour battery inside that should pull around 5.5 hours of battery life, Pretty standard, I would say, at least for an Intel gaming laptop and in terms of battery capacity. So I guess conclusion then. The strength of the Legion 7i is definitely in its screen, without a doubt. It's bright, it's fast, it supports HDR, and I think that makes this laptop very versatile in its use cases. For example, if you're a competitive gamer and a content creator, maybe you edit HDR videos for example, this would allow you to do both without any major compromises and without requiring an external monitor. It's also just an all around great laptop without any major compromises. If I had to choose the three weakest areas to improve, it would probably be the trackpad, the better life for an eight hour full time job and more key travel on the keyboard. All three of those areas are good, but they're not class leading is what I mean. I wanna make it very clear that those are not issues. Those are just the three areas that I would prioritize in terms of what to improve for the next model. So there you have it, very nice overall. Uh, personally for me, I would say this and the MSI GS66 Stealth are my two favorite gaming laptops so far. There's no first place because they each do some things better than the other, so it really depends on what aspect you value most. But if you're looking for a high-end gaming laptop with no major compromises, I would recommend this over the GS66 Stealth. That laptop does sacrifice some areas in the pursuit of portability, so it's a slightly more specialized laptop, whereas this is good for just about everything. Okay, I think I covered just about everything I wanted to talk about. Uh, all I have to say is you should subscribe if you haven't already and if you enjoyed. More subscribers means I get more review units for laptops to check out. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you next time.